Hi, Rachel here. If you like Port Saga and want more audio fiction in your life, please become a patron at patreon.com slash Rachel J. Wilkinson. You can get bonus content, access to our Patreon-only Discord server, exclusive podcast feeds for early and ad-free episode releases, and the satisfaction of supporting an independent studio. So please join us at patreon.com slash Rachel J. Wilkinson. The following episode contains adult content, violence, and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Vampire the Masquerade, Port Saga, Episode 19, Thralls and Ultimatums. I walk into Grand Courier Service to find Ruth shredding stacks of documents. Old paperwork, correspondence, maps, account records, anything that isn't a piece of furniture. No. You need to march your ass right back out that door. Grand Courier is closed. Ruth! Not a good time. The Second Inquisition struck during the day with the Wrath of God's thunder. They set fire to a Toreador haven near the gardens and a Ventru one in the financial district. They hit the South Shore Outlet Mall, too. After the vagrants scattered, they pumped acidic chemicals into the Warrens. A fake bomb scare at the Wyth building kept the students out, while a pair of assassins went in. And at the same time one team firebombed Marlowe's gallery, another ransacked a blood bank. Then, when the sun set, and Port Saga's kindred woke from their slumber, the Camarilla panicked. I was careful, Ruth. No one followed me. I need a meeting with Adelaide. Like hell you do. It's vital that I see her. Adelaide Hale has higher priorities on her agenda than you. Higher priority than claiming Praxis? Yes, survival. Now there's a door. Don't let it hit ya or your mama split ya. She could be Prince again by the end of tonight. There's a window, but it's closing fast. That's a bold assertion. <sighs> Please, just pass along the message. Tell her, tell her I know how to get it done. Let her decide if she wants to see me. Ruth stops long enough to do the calculation in her head. Knowing Adelaide has limited time, does she possibly allow a Malkavian to waste it? Do not bullshit me. How real is this window? Real enough that I wouldn't have risked my survival to come here. Okay, maybe I laid that on a bit thick. My survival isn't at risk any more than Ruth's courier services. I didn't include it in my list. All right. I'll make the call. In the meantime, you need to take those two bags to the burn pile. Happily. I grab two garbage bags full of shredded paper and head out the back. The door opens into an area protected by a chain-link fence and barbed wire. A small incinerator is next to a pair of broken bikes and a heap of garbage bags. A worker, presumably one of the couriers, feeds shredded paper into the top. I drop off the two bags and return to the front office. Well, Splash House, the gods have smiled on you tonight, and I have the unparalleled pleasure of escorting you. We leave in ten. Now, where did I put that hood? When Ruth's car stops, someone else pulls me out of the passenger seat. I hear waves and seagulls, and know we must be near the ocean. I'm walked unceremoniously into a building. Concrete floors, and the pungent aroma of fish. We climb a series of metallic stairs, enter a room, and I'm sat in a chair. When the hood finally comes off, Adelaide Hale is seated on the other side of a desk. High windows look out over a fish packing plant, but instead of workers filleting mackerel and trout at an assembly line, ghouls scurry to pack trucks while guards in full tactical gear man the exits. Everyone's on edge. Ruth stands on the other side of the office door, acting as the gatekeeper. Mr. Reed, I believe Glass told you to vacate Port Saga. I was going to, but I was waylaid at the last minute. In an attempt to vote Quill out of Praxis? You heard. I would have told Ezra not to bother. This only ends in blood. 
Sure. But you know, Ezra, we had to try it his way first. I see Glass talking to Ruth at the top of the stairs. A second later, the door opens. When Glass enters and sees me, he flinches in surprise. Jesus, kid. You're like some cursed penny that just won't go away. Is there a new development? Beyond the fact that it's an absolute shit show out there. Yeah. Club Neptune. The SI waited until the club opened to drop a sunrise bomb in the middle of it. The sunrise bomb is one of the Second Inquisition's proudest achievements. A grenade that simulates the noontime sun. They dropped it in the middle of the dance floor and sent everyone into a panic. When our people fled the building, they ran straight into the flamethrowers of the gladiest day. The club's on fire as we speak. Get emergency services over there to take care of the fire and to keep the SI out of the basement. Already done. And Dash will need six hours. Some issue with blood storage. We set sail in four. Make it work. You're leaving? We're seizing the yacht and moving offshore. So, running? We're repositioning. The Inquisition has all the clans scrambling. This is why I wanted to talk to you. Now is your opportunity to hit Cardiff House. Quill is spread thin. He's vulnerable to assassination. With what army? Yours, plus the Thin Bloods. You're joking. They're able, willing, and numerous. Provided there's a deal at the end of this. Plus the Nosferatu if you'll pay Zelda's fee. And what will that cost me? She wants you to support the motion for a Sombra Justicar, the next conclave. I bet she does. It's a small price to pay. And you won't get a better chance to decapitate him. Adelaide leans back in her chair to consider it as Edmund shakes his head. The smarter play is to take back the yacht, sail out to sea, and wait for the dust to settle. Agreed. Your revenge will have to wait, Mr. Reed. Are you kidding me? We will factor your thin bloods into our larger strategy, but we are not killing Quill. At least not tonight. What is up with you and this yacht, anyway? Why does it matter so much? Because it's mine. What stops Quill from coming after you? Don't you worry about that, kid. (sighs) This is a missed opportunity you'll regret. I've made my decision. Then I guess I'll be taking my leave. Stay. What? Stay as our guest. No, thank you. I insist. What, you taking me prisoner, Adelaide? Just until we're safely offshore. You are a liability, Mr. Reed. Unless you would prefer we rewrite your brain. How considerate. But, as you have a talent for escape, we need to take precautions. Hale opens a drawer and... and places a rosewood stake on the desk. Stake yourself. Hale's mental command immediately takes hold. And without a second thought, I reach over, pick up the stake, and drive it straight into my... There isn't an ash explosion when you get staked. You also won't turn into a flaming pile of goo or desiccate into a dry sponge. As soon as the wood pierces your heart, you go limp. You're paralyzed. It's less like a mannequin and more like a rag doll. You can still perceive the world around you, and you can still feel pain. You just can't do a damn thing about it. And that's what makes it fucking terrifying. Two guards carry me into an industrial freezer. Among crates of frozen cod, salmon, and tuna, they lay me on the ground and handcuff my ankle to a metal rigging circle bolted to the floor. Thankfully, the freezer isn't cold enough to do any permanent damage. Not yet, anyway. You can also tell a person's character by how they leave you. Do they leave you in a pile on the floor, bent and tangled, without any way to change it? Or do they place you on your back, with your hands folded neatly on your stomach? One time, I was staked, and they left one of my pant legs bunched at the knee while the other was straight. The unevenness was like an itch you couldn't scratch. Fucking terrible. Total monsters. And so here I am, staked, cuffed, and locked inside a frozen meat locker staring at a blank white ceiling. At least there's music. Titus? Titus! Uh, am I also hearing Marlowe now? Don't freak out. I feel a cold hand against my neck before it grips the collar of my shirt. I... 
need to pull you uh, closer. I slide across the floor with each tug, inch by inch. Jeez, you're a lot of dead weight. Finally able to reach the stake, she pulls it out of my chest. Uh. Lang stretched across the freezer is Marlo. She's pale, with blood stains on her blouse and pants. They've chained her ankle to the opposite wall. The way it's set up, neither of us can reach the door. We can barely reach each other. Marlo. Titus? You don't look so good. They're keeping me hungry. I wonder why they didn't just stake me too. They know you don't have a heart? <laughs> Everybody's a comedian. Have they been interrogating you? Yeah. Stick a heart enough times in a row, they won't be able to use you as a bargaining chip. Because I'll be dead dead. Yep. Couldn't happen to a nicer vampire. I should have left the stake in your chest. I warned you. This is what happens when you give a venture nothing but time to plot their revenge. Once Alexander puts down these hunters, he'll come for me. He'll drain these suits and leave them for the sun. <laughs> I have to admit, I enjoy watching you panic. Excuse me, I'm not panicking. Yes, you are. Because underneath that perfect facade, the music gives you away. Oh my god. Oh my god, I am so sick of your music moon babble bullshit. Titus, all I ever did was be nice to you. Nice to me? Nice to me? You used me. I took your photo. I invited you out for drinks and to parties. I broke you out of Cardiff House. The only reason you did that was so that I could catch Dante and give your sire an excuse to waltz in and take Praxis. Of course I did, you idiot. It's called a win-win. Well, look at us now. Winner, winner, chickpea dinner. That too. I gave you the best dining recommendations in the city. I don't do that for just anyone, but I did that for you and help you escape prison because I am your friend. You're a fucking thrall. Of yours? A uh, barf. No, Quill. I love Quill. More than anything. I told you that from the beginning. You don't love him. You're bound to him. You love him because you have to. My feelings are real. I loved him long before I tasted his blood, long before he embraced me. And the greatest thrall is the one who thinks she's free. Oh, go bite a rabbit dog. You know I'm right. Marlo lashes out to claw my face with her nails. I snatch her hand, sink my fangs into her wrist, and drink. Her blood is saccharine and fiery. I can taste the cinnamon heat of her creativity and cunning. But unlike Rebel, Quill's presence within her is thick and profound. His arrogance, his desire for power, his need to survive, it's almost... almost overwhelming. Marlo rips her arm out of my hand and rushes to the safety of her corner. But my beast hungers for more. I strain to break the chain free from the lock. I pull against the shackle around my ankle. Break, damn it. Break. Break! Dust blue walls. Tall windows facing the Atlantic. Other furniture on top of a rust-colored Turkish rug. I'm in Lawrence's condo. What the fuck is happening? Am I... Am I dead dead? Hallucinating? Is this a, a... a dream? Titus. My heart punches the inside of my chest. Lawrence. Would you come into the study, please? Unsteady on my feet, I make my way to him. Do I want to see him again? Could I even face him? Unseen hands push me forward from behind. Titus. When I cross the study's threshold, he walks around his desk to lean on the front edge. Between his stern expression and the disappointment in his eyes, I know he's upset with me. But I don't care because... he's... here. 
Your tendency toward violence is getting out of hand again. I've asked you time and again to search for other ways. I don't want my efforts to be in vain. Jesus. This is the night. The night we argued for the last time. The argument that ended our relationship and cut my timeline in two. I'm supposed to say... In vain? You asked me to get involved. You asked me to help the city. I didn't ask you to murder Anarchs. Reynolds is the prince. He asked me, and I delivered. I have seen many kindred succumb to their beasts. It always ends in blood. I care about you too much to sit idly by and let it happen. Because you've never killed anyone, huh? You and Hale never got your hands bloody? My past is irrelevant. Bullshit! You know everything about me, and I don't know anything about you. You asked me to love you, but, but you won't let me know who you are. You are deviating from the pattern. Oh, fuck your pattern. I am what you made me. You are what you want to be, and wasting the life I gave you. Our entire existence revolves around blood, but you're the only vampire on the fucking planet who doesn't seem to get that. And frankly, I am sick and tired of talking about it. On that, we agree. How is anybody supposed to survive the monumental ethical standards of St. Lawrence fucking Bennett, patron saint of hypocrites? You give me the freedom to choose my path, and then when I deviate from the pattern, you judge me for it? I am no saint. You're no sire either. I regret ever making you. And I regret ever loving you. Is that how you truly feel? I'm supposed to say yes. I did say yes. And then he gives me the ultimatum. I can either do as he says and stay in our home together, or I can leave and end things between us. <laughs> I wanted to rebel. I wanted him to chase me. I wanted him to, 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 to make me feel like I belonged, despite my flaws. So... I left him, and he let me. Answer me. Is that how you truly feel? But this time I say, no. No? No. That's not how I truly feel. Then how do you feel? If I leave here, I will regret it for the rest of my life. Because someone will murder you. And I won't ever have the chance to say I'm sorry. Or how much... How much I love you. Or how I think about you every night. There's this hole in me where you used to live. And I wake up, and for a second I forget that you're gone. And then I remember that it's too late. Titus, listen to me. When we fall into despair, we think, I am unworthy of love. I will always be unworthy. So we destroy ourselves, our neighbors, everything around us. And from the wreckage, surrounded by bodies, we reaffirm the thought, I am unworthy of love. I will always be unworthy. And so we continue the decimation. But none of us are bound to the pattern of our pasts. You can forgive me. You can forgive yourself. I know, I know. So, what do you really want? I want to come home. Titus. 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 Oh my god. Titus. 
As I come out of my frenzy, two ventral ghouls are on top of me. One tries to stake me, but misses. Ah, punctures my lung. I kick one of the guards and send him spiraling across the freezer into the loving arms of a very hungry Marlow. The remaining ghoul swings on me, but I call in my blood and dodge with ease. One punch breaks his nose, a second sends him to the floor, and a third knocks him out cold. As Marlow drains her guard, I search the other's pockets, find the keys to the shackles, and quickly free us both. Uh, you ready? We getting out of here? Strength in numbers. Why aren't we killing them? No time, no need. Let's swap clothes with these two. <laughs> no one will notice two more suits at a venture convention. Good idea. Then we grab some boxes, find their car, and drive out the front. Just like a couple of venture worker bees following their marching orders. What car? Well, Mr. Broken Nose here drives a Buick. So I guess that's what we're taking. With the venture hurrying to get out of Dodge, we slip out the front and drive off the lot. Head west on uh, Concord. There's a garage a few blocks from here where I have a spare set of wheels. Sure thing. You did something to me. I broke the bond Quill had over you. How do you feel? Doesn't change anything. No? It's like waking up from a wonderful dream when all you want to do is go back to sleep. Why would you take that from me? I never hated you, Titus, but now I... I don't know. I see the tremble of her bottom lip, the hint of bloody tears in her eyes, and I know I've gone too far. A wave of regret washes over me. I'm sorry. Did you love Lawrence? Yes. How do you know? I know because I'm lonely without him. And I'm lonely without Alexander. I don't need saving Titus. I never did. This is close enough. Pull over. Marlo. I'm getting out. I'll tell Alexander what you did for me. It might buy you something. Marlo, wait. What? What if, uh... What if I turn myself in? Why would you do that? I tried running. I tried diplomacy. I tried warfare. None of that worked. The only thing I haven't tried is taking responsibility. If it spares Rebel and Lysander, I'll do anything he wants. He may execute you. And I may be glad he did. I'll come to Cardiff House. Give me an hour to settle my affairs. It isn't wise to make him wait. Goodbye, Titus. So what's the real plan? Aaron is in the back seat. There is no real plan. Bullshit. I'm out of moves, Aaron. What are you talking about? The SI has everyone running for cover. The thin bloods are waiting in the wings. You can still go in there, guns blazing, and end this motherfucker. Without Rebel, or Constance, or the Ventru, they'll slaughter us. But wouldn't you rather go down fighting? If this is the end for me, I'd rather do some good. Save some lives rather than, you know, getting more of my friends killed. What happened to the more I kill, the less I care? Lawrence. I pull into traffic and prepare for the long road toward redemption. Aaron, you were a good friend. One of the best. And I took that for granted. I abandon you. I was so caught up in my own bullshit, I didn't see how losing Sasha hurt you. God. This is what it felt like. You didn't deserve that, or what happened to you afterward. I am so sorry I wasn't there when you needed me. 
Will you forgive me? Aaron? When I glance in my rear view, she's gone. I park next to Rebel's truck at the Port Saga rail yard. She's sitting on top of a boxcar. Since when do you drive a Buick? It's a rental. And the suit? I stole it from a Ventru. <laughs> nice. They didn't need it anymore. They're taking their yacht and getting out of here in like three hours. Rebel hops down. Wait, are you serious? Whatever cockamibi plan you've come here with, I'm not interested. No plan, Rebel. I'm only here to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not being honest with you and dragging you and Lysander into all of this. Okay. What's going on? I'm on an apology tour. Or in recovery terms, I'm making amends. I recognize that the way I acted was unfair and hurtful. So I'm on my way to making it right. How? By going to Quill. I plan to confess and include how I forced you and Lysander to help me kill Usher. Nobody forces me to do anything. I know. He'll kill you anyway. Yeah. But maybe it'll keep you two off the scaffold. Or at least give you the time you need to get out of the city. Not with the SI doing their thing. The SI is, uh, <clears throat> is done for the night. This from your BFF vampire hunter? Not precisely, but... Yeah. My real name is Charlie Evans. When I was four years old, I was kidnapped along with four other kids. After eight years, we managed to escape. Of the five of us, one of them killed themselves. Another went to prison. Another disappeared. <laughs> the fourth became a vampire. And the fifth became a vampire hunter. Yeah. You guys were part of the Fremont Five? We were. That's... that's why I saved him. Because when we were kids, he saved me. And if I'm being honest, I would have saved him even if he hadn't. I don't know what to say. You don't need to say anything. Whether it was to avenge Aaron and Lawrence, get Dante and Usher, or survive the ultimatums handed down by Quill or Hale, ever since I came to Port Saga, I've used other people to get what I wanted. It's time to change that. And again, I'm sorry for everything, Rebel. I was a giant asshole. I should have listened to you and been straight with you. I don't deserve your loyalty, but if I somehow survive this, I'd like the opportunity to earn it. You're still a cockroach, but I forgive you. If you get out of this alive, I reserve the right to tell you when you're being an asshole, and you have to promise to listen to me. Deal. So, Quill wants to kill Hale, right? Yeah. And vice versa? Yeah. Hale and her people are getting on a boat in three hours? Yeah. And Quill's people are where? Dealing with the Second Inquisition. Who aren't really a threat anymore. No, they aren't. Titus Reed, you are one genius dumbass. Vampire the Masquerade, Port Saga, created by Rachel J. Wilkinson, with voice performances by Dane Geist, Kat Mermelstein, Marta Da Silva, 
Kalina Anderson, Greg Berry, Roxy Hales, Andrew Biss, and Janika Rector. Sound design by Rachel J. Wilkinson. Mixing and mastering by Brandon Strader. Portions of this podcast are the copyrights and trademarks of Paradox Interactive AB and are used with permission, all rights reserved. For more information, please visit worldofdarkness.com.